from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's today's lineup. Over from Washburn University, Roger McGowan will advise you agricultural producers about steps you might want to take to protect yourselves from any potential legal liabilities from the use of glyphosate herbicide. Another recent court ruling gives him just cause for proposing that, and he'll outline why in just a moment. Also, Britton Rucker visits with K-State's Walt Fick about the summer native pasture outlook in Kansas and whether you producers should consider adjusting your stocking rates to take advantage of what appears to be a productive grass season ahead. And later on, with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, plus more right here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Wednesday edition of Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with us once more, a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, who also, to remind, has an appointment here at K-State as well, Roger McGowan. And Roger, you're sharing some information that all producers out there really should be attuned to right now. It has to do with the widely popular herbicide glyphosate, which has been targeted heavily in the courts, scores of lawsuits uh, alleging that this widely popular herbicide is the source of cancer problems in people. You have a message for producers not to ignore this, which we'll get into, but bring us up to speed on the latest litigation in this area. Well, you're right. There there are more than just a few cases in the pipeline. There are over 11,000 of these cases that are in the pipeline waiting to be litigated mm-hmm. or settled or dealt with in one way or the other. But, of course, people will remember last late summer, early fall, there was a almost a $300 million verdict by a California jury in a case involving an individual that had applied Roundup in his job as, as a groundskeeper slash janitor for a school out in California. And uh, when that got to the judge in that case, he cut it down by about two-thirds. Oh, well, just a couple of weeks ago, we had another California jury in a different case uh, that came back with an $81 million damage award for another individual that had used Roundup over a long period of time. Now, we'll see what the judge does with that. But a key thing on that case was that that case was heard by the judge that has been designated as the judge to hear these cases, and he designated that case as a bellwether case. What that means is it's a trend-setting case, the way that came out. So I think it's, uh, unfortunately, I think it's time that producers and the rest of us in ag start to pay attention to this. And we can't just dismiss these first two cases as the result of wild-eyed California juries (laughs) that don't know anything about ag and are in urban areas. Um, This could have tentacles um, that are not going to be good for agriculture. So there's some things that producers need to be thinking about and talking about in terms of just practical steps that they can take to protect themselves at this point. And really to remind, glyphosate usage is so broad that this is going to potentially encompass a wide majority of producers out there, Roger. Well, it it could affect uh, just about anybody. I mean, this is uh, a product that is presently sold in more than 160 countries. Uh, It's very heavily used on corn and soybeans, including genetically modified corn and soybeans. And it's even being used on oats as a drying agent, uh, so it'll dry faster. Uh, So it's a big deal. And like I said, there are over 11,000 of these cases that are out there, and their basic claim is that it's a cancer-causing agent. And the plaintiffs in these cases cases are hanging their hat on a 2015 statement by the International Agency for Research on Cancer that classified glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. 
Well, that classification is what spurred the lawsuits. But the U.S. EPA says that glyphosate is safe for humans when it's used in accordance with labeled directions, and that's the key. Plus, the World Health Organization has said that glyphosate is unlikely to pose a carcinogenic risk to humans from exposure through the diet. Now, that's a whole different issue from these first two cases that were litigated. Those first two cases where we got the jury verdicts were a result of use of the product by an individual over a long period of time. We haven't had any food cases yet. But those food cases are out there. And those can be a little bit scary uh, where somebody sues based on the claim that traces of glyphosate were in food products that they ate. And the way we produce uh, some food products in the United States um, with identity preserved contracts and all the technology that we have, uh, what's the likelihood that that uh, particular food product, uh, the the contents of it can be traced back to the farm where the grain came from, right. where the glyphosate was used. That's a, that's the scary prospect for a producer. The liability could extend clear back to the farm gate. So is there anything that producers in a proactive sense could be doing to, in a, at least a minimal way, protect against such a liability? Well, there is. And I I think it's time for producers to start thinking about these things. First of all, if they're a landlord operating uh, under a lease agreement with a tenant, I think they want to go back in and reexamine those lease terms and give some consideration as to whether they want language in the lease that says that the tenant is assuming the risks uh, from the use of Roundup or products that contain glyphosate or perhaps kind of in the similar vein uh, include language in the lease that involves the tenant either waiving potential legal claims against the landlord or providing for the landlord to be indemnified by the tenant for any and all glyphosate-related claims. I think those are a couple practical uh, things that producers should start to think about right now and and maybe uh, specify in the lease that the tenant has the sole discretion to select chemicals to be used on the farm and that any such chemicals uh, that are going to be used on the farm are going to be used in accordance with labeled directions. Or maybe you just say, tenant, you cannot use glyphosate-related products. But anyway... You know, if the tenant is going to give up some of those rights, uh, the landlord is going to need to figure out a way to compensate them mm-hmm. for not using these types of products. So it's a risk-reward type uh, balance that, that has to be engaged in. That's one thing that you can do from a landlord-tenant perspective to protect yourself as the landlord. Whatever would be crafted, though, needs to be in writing. Oh, absolutely. It's another good reason to get those leases in writing. Right. Now, can one's insurance policy perhaps provide some liability relief here? Well, farmers need to take a look at that. Uh, Of course, uh, many farmers have a comprehensive farm liability policy through their insurance carrier, but a lot of those comprehensive policies for ag will have what's called a pollution exclusion clause. The question that we have, and this is a question that can only be answered by the company, itself, and you want to have a well-trained attorney that's that's versed in reading insurance policies examine the, the policy language. But the question is going to be as to whether glyphosate-related damages uh, would be excluded from coverage under the language in that pollution exclusion clause. In, in other words, is it pollution or is it not? And that depends on how pollution is defined in the policy. So you need to find out how it is right. defined. You need to be very clear on that. And there could be relief there, but don't assume that by any stretch. Now, what about those producers who employ others on the farm? What strategy would one want to think about in regard to liability protection there? Well, the the owner that hires the employees, the owner of the operation, I, from their perspective, they may want to consider switching from an employer-employee relationship to that of uh, hiring independent contractors. Because the law will say if an individual is truly an independent contractor, then they have control of the work. You're just telling them what needs to be done, and they can make the decision as to how they accomplish that. And hence, if they use a glyphosate product – then they would be responsible for it, at least in theory. So that would give the farm operator, uh, farm owner, conceivably more protection if they switch employer-employee relationships to independent contractor relationships. So that's another conversation that needs to be had with the uh, legal counsel for the, a particular farming operation. And that would be a different tact altogether in terms of employee relationship. But back to this concern about whether or not litigation and uh, 
liability could extend back to the farm. Do you think the atmosphere is out there that could facilitate that, unfortunately? Well, I think at some point, again, there are more than 11,000 of these cases in the pipeline. Um, At some point, there's going to be a case or multiple cases where consumers of food products claim that they were harmed by the presence of glyphosate uh, in the food that they ate. And if those cases arise, Given, as I said earlier, the uh, use of production contracts in ag and the possibility perhaps of tracing all the way back to the farm from which the grain in the allegedly contaminated food product was grown, does the farmer have liability in that situation? Well, if we think that that is far-fetched that a jury could say yes, uh, remember that there's presently a member of the U.S. Congress that is uh, proposing the Uh, regulation, if not the elimination of cows. Uh, Whoever thought we would hear something (laughs) like that. So it's not that far-fetched. And and relatedly, there are certain segments of the population in the United States that are opposed to the manner in which modern conventional agriculture is conducted. And those persons or groups wouldn't wouldn't hesitate to try to pin liability all the way back down the chain to the farmer. So with that said, even though we haven't had any food cases yet, given that there are so many cases in the pipeline, this is something that producers now need to, if they haven't already, need to take seriously, talk with their legal counsel, talk with their insurance people about these particular issues and take steps that they can at this point in time to uh, try to provide some protection from liability for themselves. Don't ignore this is the point there. And just as a concluding thought, this whole suite of lawsuits, cases, one wonders, Roger, if this whole matter will someday end up at the doorstep of the U.S. Supreme Court because agriculture has a heavy stake in this. But not only agriculture, uh, lawn care, homeowners who use glyphosate, there's a great, great deal involved here that would probably merit a a broad scope ruling of some kind. It's a big deal. That's that's certainly feasible down the road. And it's also feasible, I suppose, that we could see the government step in and say, well, we're just not going to allow that product to be used or products that contain glyphosate. Boy, that would be a game changer for a lot of people. So we'll just have to keep our eyes open on this. It is a very important issue. No doubt. And, of course, Roger has captured all of this in his blog recently, dated April the 4th. You can read about Do the Roundup Jury Verdicts Have Meaning for My Farming Operation? It is at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Always important information, Roger. Thanks for coming over, as always. Thank you, Eric. He is a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. Roger McGowan, opening up this first part of Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Many livestock producers are anxiously looking forward to turning out livestock to graze pastures. But many producers are wondering, due to the abundant amount of moisture we received in our native pastures, what the grazing season will look like. Here to discuss this further is Range and Pasture Management Specialist from Kansas State University, Walt Fick. Walt, what is your assessment of our native pastures recently? Well, right now, the, uh, they're, they're pretty slow in terms of their, their growth. A couple of reasons, of course. I think the cooler weather in the last month or so slowed things down. Now, again, we've got both you know, native warm season pastures. Those are the ones that are, are just now starting to green up just a little bit. The cool season grasses are probably behind as well. You know, those that might have a smooth brome or tall fescue. I think, you know, in the southeastern part of the state, that's they're starting to grow pretty well there. But I think even the cool season grasses are a little behind schedule. But that could all change. I mean, we've had really good moisture the last, well, actually since last fall. 
You know, if you look at a drought monitor these days, there's no place in Kansas showing any any right. type of uh, drought conditions. So we have good soil moisture. So I think now it's just a matter of getting the right temperatures so those plants will, will start growth. If we start getting these 80-degree days, we'll see these pastures really grow fairly quickly. And these little cold snaps we're getting, does that really play a factor in these grasses? Oh, it probably just stalls things out a little bit. Uh, I've seen grasses before, you know, you, you, with moisture and you get a nice warm day and they'll, you know, some of the grasses, they'll, they'll grow two or three inches, it seems like, in one day. Mm-hmm. So that could happen fairly quickly. But yeah, when you get, uh, you know, even below 50 degree temperatures, that, that slows down the warm season grasses, let alone, you know, if we have some frost here in the near future. And like you mentioned before, the moisture aspect, what could producers look forward in that aspect? Well, I'm not a weather forecaster, but as, as I look at their projections, a little bit different than last year. You know, last year we were early part of the growing season in May, June, July. It was pretty hot and dry. Well, this year they're talking about the probabilities for this part of the country are above normal precipitation and cooler than normal temperatures. So if that's right, you know, that could bode for fairly good forage production. And due to that, would you expect higher stocking rates? Well, some people might want to do that. I'm not a big fan of that necessarily. I think in the long run, we want to stick with our long-term, or maybe more conservative stocking rates. It also depends on individual operations. Some people have a little more flexibility in terms of what I would call put-and-take animals. You know, mm-hmm. if uh, one has a cow herd, you could you know buy some stockers if you think you're going to have above a normal forage production. And uh, the nice thing about that, the flexibility there is then you can always turn around and sell them fairly short order if uh, things go the other direction. So I don't know. It's really hard to predict. I think people should probably stick to their long-term stocking rates, and and they should be fine. You know, we had the good moisture last fall, and and I think those plants regained their vigor from last year's grazing quite well. So starting the season, they should be in in good shape. But I don't know that you want to overdo it either because in the long run, that can, can be detrimental. We're fortunate in in eastern Kansas, you know, if we overdo it for a season or something or even longer sometimes, we have a very resilient system Mm -hmm. that seems to rebound quite well. However, if you go west, then it takes longer for pastures to recover if you overdo it. So going into that, have you seen pastures really recover around the state of Kansas due to all this moisture? Well, it's probably too early to tell, I think, right now until this growing season gets going here shortly. and, and uh, But I think they should recover quite well. It'll depend, again, on how they were, were managed last year. But, you know, if, if they were given uh, any rest at all, you know, some people use systems that provide a late summer rest, for instance. I think those pastures will be in excellent shape because we did have the, the late summer moisture to provide regrowth before the plants went into the wintertime. So those would should be in really good shape. But if they, they overgrazed all last summer, well, it, it may be slow to start this year. And even with all this moisture, you're not advising producers to modify their stocking plan? I don't think so. I, th- I think we stick with, a, with our normal stocking rates and, and plans. Again, if the people running stalkers, again, they, they might have the flexibility if they wanted to add a few more head, they, they could do that because they can always start calling them back off or, and selling as, as the season goes along if necessary. In some places that are really wet, would that affect the date at which you would turn livestock out? Well, not unless it's going to cause some, some real trampling problems. You know, mm-hmm. if, it's, if it's really muddy, cattle will kind of concentrate sometimes along the fence and gates. I, I've seen quite a bit of uh, damage done with the soil. You know, it's just muddy, particularly oh, some systems maybe where they're rotating animals, where you have a higher stock density then. So that could cause some problems, but we'll just have to wait and see. I don't, I don't know that we're going to be that wet where we're going to have those sort of problems. So, well, if we have lush, productive pastures, would that affect one's choice of providing free choice mineral? Well, uh, that's a little bit out of my, my line, I think. But, you know, I think free choice salt and minerals pretty pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, then the other things that come in with supplementation like that is, is uh, maybe th- things for fly control and stuff rather than using ear tags or some other approaches. You can right. do that with a supplement. One thing, I guess, is, as I brought up that word supplement, that could be an issue. I've seen it happen before. Sometimes, you know, the, the season starts and people get their cattle out there. 
if we go into a period of oh, cloudy, colder weather, that'll slow down plant growth. And it's mm-hmm. possible that the animals could actually get ahead of the grass where they might not be getting enough intake. And in those cases, actually supplementing some uh, energy supplement might be in line a thing to do. You know, years past, we, we've used St. Weather's cracked Milo, but, but some sort of energy supplement early in the season if the forage is, is a little short. Now, you talked about fly control with the wet pastures. What are you advising to producers in that aspect? Well, I expect we'll have flies. You know, again, the uh, horn flies are generally there all the time, and, and those are ones that we need to deal with. They're, they're a, a blood-sucking insect, so they, they can cause some, some real problems. And, and again, so I think you, know, you want to have a plan in place. How are you going to deal with, with flies? And whether you're using, you know, ear tags or whether you're using uh, back rubbers, you know, or, or some of these other methods. But I think you do need to have a plan in place uh, to take care of the, the flies because we know if we don't, oh, you can lose 15, 20 pounds of gain on, on stalker cattle. Mm-hmm. Well, while it sounds like we have a high potential of having a great grazing season, thanks for being here. Thank you. That was Walt Fick, Range and Pasture Management Specialist at K-State. And heading into the break, a reminder, K-State will be hosting an array of field days. Tomorrow is the 105th Annual Roundup. The event will be hosted in the auditorium at K-State Agricultural Research Center in Hayes. The lineup for the event will include registration beginning at 9 a.m. with the commercial trade show. Then at 10 a.m., the official welcome. Then sessions will include beginning at 1010, new insights into subseasonal, seasonal, and interannual weather and climate extremes in the Great Plains with Dr. Jeffrey Bossera. Then at 1105, bovine anaplasmosis with Dr. Katie Reif at the Center of Excellence for Vector Born Diseases. Then at 1245, a review of limit feeding with Dr. Dale Blassie. Then at 140, Range and Wildfire, a road to recovery with Dr. Keith Harmony. And the final session of the day will be at 2.15 on the effect of intensive early stocking cow-calf pairs on cow performance with Dr. John Yeager. Registration is available by contacting Melissa at 785-625-3425. And then K-State Research and Extension will host its annual Beef, Cattle, and Forage Crops Field Day on Thursday, May 2nd in Parsons. The event starts at 8.30 a.m. with registration, followed by the program at 9 a.m. Coffee and donuts will be available in the morning and lunch will be served, compliments of numerous sponsors, followed by the morning presentations. Sponsors will have displays available throughout the field day. Program topics and speakers include Beef Cattle Market Outlook Synthesis by Glenn Tonzer, K-State Agricultural Economist, then Modern Approaches to Fescue Pasture Management for Beef Cattle by Eric Bailey, Extension Beef Specialist at the University of Missouri, Then moving on, Supplementation of Cows Grazing Cool Season Forages by Jamie Lynn Farney, K-State Southeast Area Beef Specialist. Then Epidemic of Weak and Stillborn Calves in the Midwest During Spring of 2019 by Greg Hanselcheck, K-State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And finally, what worked and what didn't in the last 40 years of beef cattle research by Lyle Lamas, animal scientist at K-State Southeast Agricultural Research Center. More information is available by calling 620-421-4826. For Agriculture Today, I'm Britton Rucker, and we'll be back with more after this break over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. 
Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to the midweek edition of Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. And now on to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, numbers taken from the just-released USDA 2017 Census of Agriculture show that California remains the highest state in the land for taxing farmers' property. In 17, the ranch and farm operations in California paid $1.13 billion. That's an average of $17,000 per farm. And California farm property taxes rose $300 million over that five-year span, despite losing 6,000 farms. California property taxes paid rose 26.5% from 2012 to 17. Nationally, 1.9 million farmers paid $9.4 billion worth of property taxes in 2017. That was up $2 billion from five years earlier, a 21% increase. Now, the average property tax paid by farmers nationally was $4,902 in 17. That compared with $3,752 per farm in 2012. Texas was the second highest state for property taxes at $698 million. That was a 20% hike from 2012. But those property taxes were split among 236,000 total farmers. So the average property tax paid in Texas was $2,958. Per farm. Nebraska fell in as the third highest state for property taxes in 17, 42,500 farmers paying $668.5 million. That was a 30% hike from 2012. On a per farm basis, that breaks down to $16,151 per operation, second only to California. And you Kansas farmers saw your property taxes increase nearly 30%, according to the census, during that stretch of time. That was the third highest highest jump in percentage as you paid an average of $5,831 in property taxes. What is the latest news on U.S. efforts to reach trade deals with both Japan and the European Union, especially from the perspective of agriculture here in the nation? Here's a look at that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Two news tidbits from the trade front. I want to move forward on Japan. I think that's really important for farmers. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer before a Senate committee last month. And the U.S. and Japan are moving forward with trade talks. With agriculture part of the discussion between Ambassador Lighthizer and Japan's Economic Revitalization Minister earlier this week. Both pledged to accelerate talks between the two nations. Meanwhile, the European Union's Trade Commissioner says her government is ready to talk a new trade deal with the U.S., only one thing, according to Commissioner Cecilia Malmstrom. We have been very clear that from the EU side, we are not going to discuss agriculture. Not what the U.S. ag sector wants to hear, with some lawmakers saying this could make any U.S.-EU trade deal difficult to pass in Congress. One other note, quiet yet progressing trade negotiations between the U.S. and China and a potential lifting of Chinese tariffs on U.S. farm exports. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. As a footnote there, new figures released by the European Commission show that imports of U.S. soybeans by the European Union increased 121 percent over the current market year compared to the same period the previous year. With a share of 72 percent of EU soybean imports, the U.S. is today Europe's number one supplier. Conversely, Europe is the top destination of U.S. soybean exports, now with 22 percent, followed by China, 18 percent, and Mexico at 9 percent. Increasing trade in a number of areas and products, including soybeans, was one of the joint statement objectives as agreed to by Presidents Trump and Juncker last July. In terms of the EU's total imports of soybeans, the U.S. share at 72 percent compares to 36 percent the same period the previous year. This now puts the U.S. well ahead of Brazil, uh, the EU's second main supplier, at 21 percent, followed by Ukraine, Canada, and Paraguay. 
And representatives of the U.S. wheat industry are in Brazil this week to talk about demand once the tariff-free quota of 750,000 metric tons is opened by Brazil. The U.S. group met with the president of Brazil's Wheat Milling Association, Rubens Barbosa, who said they know Brazil will continue to import significant amounts of wheat in the coming years and they want to increase their share of that market, his comments, adding that that group supports the import quota since it will provide its industry access to a greater supply at lower prices. There's been no date set for implementation of the quota that will cover wheat from all sources, but Barbosa noted that government is working on the regulation. The U.S. is expected to hold some competitive advantage under the quota, but Russia has now been uh, making overtures to Brazil as a wheat supplier, which could be a factor. Well, a disease historically prevalent in the southeastern United States has spread west and north to cow herds here in Kansas and other states. As first brought up on yesterday's broadcast, a new research project here at K-State is looking at more effective control measures for anaplasmosis. Todd Domer offers us another look at that. Researchers at Kansas State University have been awarded a $1.2 million grant to study the optimal antimicrobial use for controlling anaplasma marginal, the causative agent of bovine anaplasmosis. Led by the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine, the research team will determine the susceptibility of different strains of anaplasma marginal to chlorotetracycline. The project will look at three different chlorotetracycline treatment protocols for cattle, with scientists at K-State providing practical recommendations for controlling the disease to the Food and Drug Administration and ultimately cattle producers. The team has a goal of creating treatment policies that maximize the therapeutic effect while minimizing the risk of developing resistance. Anaplasma marginal strains recently have been isolated in Kansas cattle herds. Ranchers across the state are concerned the current FDA-approved anaplasmosis treatment regimens are not sufficiently controlling the disease. Efficacy concerns over the current anaplasmosis control measures underscore the need for updated science-based recommendations to help cattle producers manage the disease. Anaplasmosis is caused by a blood parasite and transmitted from animal to animal by biting flies, ticks, and contaminated needles or surgical instruments. Losses can range from poor animal performance to abortions, bull infertility, and cow deaths. Members of the K-State research team will host an outreach event on anaplasmosis May the 20th at the Hilton Garden Inn in Manhattan, Speakers, including a producer panel, will discuss strategies and best practices for managing anaplasmosis. I'm Todd Domer. Today's agricultural news headlines there. Well, somebody's celebrating his 87th birthday today. He's up next on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. I looked up April 17, and the moment I read the title of that short vignette, I said, thank you, Hal. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Today, I'm going to be totally selfish with my brief vignette for the week. Generally, I have a topic which I hope holds interest to at least some of the listeners. I know you can't please all the people all the time, but today I'm thinking of myself. The reason? The old man is turning 87 today, and that's not a bad age. There's a lot to be thankful for. There's health. Oh, yes, I have five stents, but I never think of them. I have friends and loved ones, family, so thank you. 
A few weeks ago, I pulled one of my favorite books from the shelves titled 12 Moons of the Year by Hal Borland. It is his own selection from his nature editorials in the New York Times. They were edited by Barbara Dodge Borland. In this book, one of my favorites, he writes brief vignettes for each day, dated January 1, January 2, 3, 4, etc. So, I looked up April 17, and the moment I read the title of that short vignette, I said, Thank you, Hal. And I marked it on my calendar for today. A gift to myself from Hal Borland, written thoughtfully years ago. Borland selected 365 of his outdoor editorials, of which he wrote more than 1,900. And by the way, Hal Borland wrote many books about the natural world. He had a countryman's wisdom, which I envy him for. He died in 1978, four years after I came to Kansas. But here is my story, the gift to myself on April 17. It's titled Morning Fog. As a brief introduction, I'll say this. The difference between a mist and a fog is density. A mist tends to be not as dense as a fog. A fog is, of course, a low-hanging cloud. I know fogs are dangerous, but I'm not driving. I, in my mind, am in a very familiar place, and I see and feel a very heavy fog settling all around me. As I slowly move or lean across the gate, I move the fog particles, the droplets around me. I just love it. It's all silence. A few sounds I do hear, but cannot see. I hear the calves bawl, but I cannot see them. Only when the cow steps out or I walk forward can I see the misty outline of its face. With heavy fog, I cannot even see its hindquarters. To see nothing, to feel moisture, I love it. But here is the story. Morning Fog by Hal Borland Fog which technically is nothing but a cloud in contact with the earth, can be a nuisance and a hazard to travelers. But if one can stay where he is for a few hours, a morning fog, especially in early spring, creates a degree of magic that makes one forget hazards as well as technicalities. It comes in the night and it lingers through the dawn, soft, chill, faintly luminous. You step out into the dooryard just before sunrise and you are on a familiar island in a strange new world. The trees that were just down the road yesterday, the hill that was across the way, even the horizon itself have vanished. On every side and even overhead hangs that soft white veil, unsubstantial as smoke but impenetrable to the eye. Even a tall tree only 50 yards away has no top. It's a damp, dark pole, stark against the fog. Somewhere above that pole a robin sings, and far off in the wide distance another robin answers, but there isn't a bird in sight. Then the sun comes up. It isn't a familiar sun, it's a shimmer, a warmth of silver light that seems to come from everywhere. A wisp of breeze swirls the fog, and the tall tree has a top again. For an instant, there is an incredible blue patch of sky, and then it's gone. The shimmer becomes a dazzle, and the little island dooryard begins to widen. The hill is there again. Slowly the sun warms the air, and the magic vanishes. The fog rises, and the familiar world reappears. But for a little while, the fog made a world all its own, a fantastic, mysterious world, evanescent as the fog itself. 
as Borant described so well, it is the very familiar which suddenly is all different. Oh, so special. The sounds seem to carry further. I remember the old country where neighbors were closer. You knew where they were. You could hear what they were doing, the milking, the chores. But you could not see until the earth warmed up and the fog lifted. There was a slight breeze. The scent was even different. One early foggy morning, driving the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, a huge buck with a mighty wreck stood in the middle of the quiet road. It looked like an elk. Then it disappeared among the dripping trees. It seems that in a silent fog, things look bigger than they really are. But the buck I saw was a big buck, a mighty buck, standing proudly. It's more than 50 years ago, and I still see the momentary scene as the fog just started to lift and the hazy sun came up. It is true. Good books with good stories keep on giving. That's why I love books. Thank you, Hal. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. And happy 87th, Gus. That's our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. For Britton Rucker, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.